Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, I want to welcome everyone uh, to this really interesting and amazing talk with uh, Sheikh Hamza. Um, uh, it's entitled Kalam. And the Kalam, Russell's Teapot and the Flying Spaghetti Monster. So inshallah, before uh, before we begin, inshallah, we'll have the introduction by Dr. Muhammad Raviz, who is a faculty member at Dar al-Qasim. Dr. Raviz. Jazakallah khair, Nabil. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce someone uh, very special to me, um, Sheikh Hamza Karmali. He doesn't know, but I've been, you know, taking his classes online since I was a teenager, and um, I was fortunate to spend a few weeks studying with him when I lived in Jordan. And so, a little bit about our uh, Ustad today. He is. Um, someone who has studied the Islamic sciences with scholars from uh, different parts of the Muslim world, primarily in Jordan, Kuwait, the UAE, and in India, where he holds uh, a master's and a degree in Islamic law and theology from Jamia Nilamiya, Hyderabad, India. Uh, he's over the years taught on several online venues, such as the former Sunni path, which is now Qibla, the esteemed uh, Arabic Institute, Qasid in Amman, Jordan, where he, you know, was the teacher that everyone wanted to study the, the high-level grammar with. And you were a very fortunate student if you could do that. Um, also, Kalam Research and Media, where he published uh, a wonderful monograph that I recommend every Muslim in the West should read, called the Madrasa Curriculum and Context, which is a terse yet very rich articulation of the traditional Ottoman uh, Madrasa system and its extension elsewhere, um, developed by the 16th century Ottoman scholar Tashko Prizada in his work Miftah Sada. Um, and just generally the workings, the books, the authorities, and the prospects for Madrasa graduates. And modern life have, has of course shifted um, many of the these powers of the Madrasa to, to the periphery. Uh, more recently, in the study of Kalam, uh, from what I know, uh, that he has studied primarily with the eminent Mutakallim, contemporary Mutakallim Said Fauda in Amman. Um, and my, my own view of Sheikh Hamza is that one may even consider him a type of polemical theologian, similar to uh, Sheikh Amin and even our Sin Mulana Qasim Nanotwi, uh, in the sense that their engagements with other religious groups was designed to demonstrate their flaws and their reasoning. I even once heard Ustad Hamza say to the effect that um, he has heard ar arguments from top scholars of other traditions, and none of them have proofs the way that Islam is generated by the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, most recently in 2019, he, Ustad Hamza founded Basira Education uh, to fill a gap in the religious edu education of Muslims in the modern world. And his goal with Basira is to develop a kind of seminary level curriculum grounded in the traditional sciences that integrates uh, modern science and culture into what he calls an intelligent and God-centered worldview. Ustad, we're very excited to have you. The Fantan Bismillah. Bismillah khairan. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Thank you, um, Muhammad, for the introduction. Um, just one small correction. I haven't, um, I'm not, uh, I'm not a student of Sheikh Said Foda. Um, I've never studied with him, uh, but we have a, uh, a cordial relationship and we've collaborated on some projects together. Um, so my teacher in, uh, in Kalam is, uh, uh, is in, uh, is uh, it comes from Damascus, not from Damascus, from uh, the city of Hama in uh, in Syria, um, and uh, he lives in the UAE. Uh, his name is Sheikh Abdul Karim Tatan, and uh, I had I had the blessing of uh, asking him many questions, um, and that's where I will um, I will uh, begin. Okay, which is asking questions. So, uh, alhamdulillah, uh, I love Islam, and I um, I believe and I know that all of you who are listening to me also um, love Islam. 
And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he taught us to say, Raditu Billahi Rabban wa bil Islam Dinan wa bi Muhammadin Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Nabiyan wa Rasula, which means that I am pleased with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala as my Lord. I'm happy to have Allah as my Lord. And I'm happy and I'm pleased to have Islam as my religion. And I'm happy and I'm pleased to have the Messenger of Allah, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as my Prophet and as my Messenger. So um, uh, the um, so when I when I say this, and uh, the where where does this come from? This comes from uh, this comes from questions that I asked my teachers. So Sheikh Abdul Karim, but also others, and I used to ask a lot of questions. And I would go and I would go prepared. Uh, I would prepare my classes. I would read ahead, and I would come with ten questions. And we'd read, we'd read whatever it had that we would read, and then I would ask my questions. <laughs> and uh, and so in all of the in all of the sciences, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala blessed me uh, with people who uh, who they um, listened to my questions. And they heard my questions and they never told me not to ask my questions and they answered my questions and when i uh, when i objected to their answers they uh, listened to me and they told me that you are right and uh sometimes i was uh, i mean that was their humility so i'm 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 what i'm trying to so they told me sometimes when my objections were were you know raised things that they might not have thought of they um they uh, they they told me i was right they thanked me <laughs> for asking my questions and for objecting to them and they revised their answers and they came back to me and they told me and one 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 of them um they he told me that that i i learned so much that you're the one who teaches me the class so um so that was part of their that was their uh, that was their humility and that was the time that they gave me. And when they did that, they gained my respect. Uh, because uh, because when uh, the thing, you actually, the thing that, that helps you, uh, that, that uh, the teachers who gained my respect are those who um, they, uh, they are, they, they, they behaved in this way. Because somebody who behaves in this way, they don't have anything to hide. And they ha they are confident in what they believe in, and they are open to qu to being questioned, and they give you reasons for uh, why they hold their positions, and that's what a scholar is. So in my um, in my eyes, a alim is somebody who uh, who understands not just conclusions, but he understands the reasoning that takes you to those conclusions. And he understands that reasoning when he, he entertains your questions, he listens to your questions, he answers your questions. And it's in that back and forth, in that uh, back and forth that he demonstrates his knowledge, that he demonstrates his understanding. So, and it was this back and forth that led me to, uh, that led me to love Islam, to love, uh, to love this religion. And I um, and as I it gave me an understanding of what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was like. That, that's what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was like. That's what his companions were like. So when you study the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there's one companion who uh, who held who I always he had he's always had a special place in my heart. Sayyidina Mus'ab ibn Umair. Sayyidina Mus'ab ibn Umair, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he sent him as a uh, to teach the people of Medina, to call them to Islam before the Hijrah. And there are, uh, there's a famous incident with Sayyidina Musab where he was talking to the new Muslims in, uh, in, uh, in sitting around a well in a garden in Medina. And the leaders of, uh, of, of the Ansar, they saw him and they said that you're corrupting our youth. You're corrupting our youth. And, uh, and uh, you know, but I'm just paraphrasing, go back to where you came from. And they got angry at him because there were people who were responding to him, responding positively and accepting Islam. So he said to them, and this is, this is the reason why I'm, I'm telling this story. He said to them, 
uh, why don't you why don't you sit down and listen to me? If you if you like if you don't like what I say, if you disagree with what I say, reject it. And if you agree with what I say, accept it. <laughs> and the the these there were two of these leaders. They came and they listened to him. And they said uh, they came angry, and they were they were coming down ready to condemn. And uh, and he said this, and they said, "Oh, that sounds reasonable." And they sat down, and he explained things to them, and he answered their questions, and their face changed as he was talking to them, and they became Muslim. And when they became Muslim. They're, since they were leaders, many, many people followed them in becoming Muslim. And this was one of the reasons for the spread of Islam in Medina that prepared the way for the Prophet wasallam to emigrate to Medina. So the uh, and, and this is how the Prophet wasallam was. Do you think nobody ever asked the Prophet wasallam prove to me that God exists? Do you think that nobody ever asked the Prophet wasallam prove to me that you're a genuine messenger from God? Um, uh, of course not. So, so the Prophet ﷺ, he was asked these questions. Some of these, some of the answers have been explicitly transmitted. Others have come uh, implicitly. But this is who the Prophet ﷺ was. This is who his companions were. And down throughout the throughout the ages, this is who our um, our scholars were. They were people who, and they continue to be. There's, there, continue, there, there, there are people who continue to be like that. You go to them, you object, you, uh, uh, you, uh, uh, you, uh, you, 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 you ask your questions. They listen to you. They respond to everything that you say. And when they do that, then they gain your confidence, and you love them, and you love Islam. Okay. So this is the. Um, this is uh, this is and this is uh, so this is so this uh, this uh, so Islam so in the Quran there's no verse in the Quran that tells you don't use your mind there's no verse in the Quran that says don't ask questions to the contrary Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he speaks to the disbelievers and he says afala taqilun um you know there's so many times that this verse comes in the Quran afala taqilun don't you, won't you use your minds? Don't you use your minds and do the right, do, uh, good judgment? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, he doesn't say don't ask questions, but there's many, many verses in the Quran which are, yes, alunaka. They ask you about this. They ask you about this. They ask you about this. So the, uh, the, this is the spirit of the Quran. And it's the spirit of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it's the spirit of our religion. And from this spirit, there came a science. And that science is called the science of Kalam. So this, the Kalam means, uh, means many things. Um, so uh, Kalam literally it means speech, but uh, it's the name for one of the sciences of one of the Islamic sciences, which uh, from an early age, I've been attracted to. Uh, so I've I've been attracted to it, something that I've uh, I've studied I've read a lot in it I have um, it's the probably the science in which I'm most experienced um, and um, and I want to share with you uh, today um, something about this science and why this science is important. So the science. Uh, the scholars of the science they give a definition of the science and if you look at any of the old books of Kalam, old books of this science, um, you know, whether, and so in the traditional Indian curriculum, um, the this science is represented in a book called Sharh al-Aqa'id al um, and a book that studied throughout the Indian subcontinent, but not just in the Indian subcontinent, at Al-Azhar it was studied all over the world. It's probably the most widespread and influential uh, textbook of Kalam uh, ever to be written or taught. And it continues to command wide influence. Um, and uh, and and if you you can look in this book in its commentaries, or you can look in other books such as the Jawharat al Tawheed, which was taught at Azhar, authored at Azhar, and um, other books. And the definitions they all revolve around the same idea. And the definition will be something like this: that this is a science that enables you 
to rationally prove to rationally prove your the points the things the articles of faith it allows you ilmun yuqtadaru bihi ala ithbat al aqaid al diniya min adillatiha al yaqiniya it's a science that enables you so it's a science that enables you so so somebody so a uh, when you when you when you master a science then you gain an ability you gain an ability this ability so mastering any of the sciences of islam it doesn't it's not in uh, you know saying explaining an issue that's the first step the first step is explaining a masala explaining a question and doing a commentary on it and what happens if this is what happens if, if this is the case but the when when uh, through uh, through prolonged study of the science with a teacher who has uh, who has an ability then when one learns the science one can uh, one gains the ability to uh, to do what the scholars of that science do so with with the science of kalam when one studies it one gains an ability one gains an ability to ilm yuqtadaru bihi ala isbat al aqaid al diniya you gain an ability to prove to prove aqaid diniya to prove that the articles of our faith the articles of our religion faith is a word that we're going to look at probably not the best word to for me to use the articles of our belief religious belief such as god exists god is one nothing resembles god god does not resemble anything uh, god did not begin to exist god is all powerful god is all knowing god is alive god speaks these are these attributes through this science and and also that that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is a genuine messenger of god that this fact is something that through this science you gain an ability to prove that it is true so somebody comes to you and they can come to you and say prove to me that god exists you can do it and they come to you and they say well i don't agree with it because of quantum theory uh, and and that and that you know there's uh, in in quantum physics there's particles that just pop into existence without any cause so if you if you've uh, through through if you've studied this science then you gain an ability to respond to this objection so the and and then you you so somebody who's mastered the science you can become like 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 uh like uh, some of the people who i described at the beginning of this class you can go to them and you can ask them any question and they'll give you an they they'll, they'll work with you to find an answer and and working with you to find an answer is important because it's not just this is the answer because you're not in the, the this science is not is not based on just taking an answer you have to be convinced so it's so a real a real uh, teacher of the science they'll work with you they'll show you they'll answer your questions they'll entertain your objections and and it's and it's a science so so this is what this science is about and this science is um the it's it's one of its names is usul ad-din it is the foundation of religion it lays the foundation for religion so uh, muhammad dr muhammad pervez and i we've had many conversations on Mustafa Sabri and he actually asked me initially to talk about Mustafa Sabri maybe um if uh, uh in the future if we meet again uh, I can tell you something about Mustafa Sabri but Mustafa Sabri he was uh one of he was he was a mutakallim and I consider him to be uh the uh, in my estimation uh he is the greatest mutakallim of the 20th century um him and so he of uh, he's the there were i don't you, it's difficult to say he's the greatest because you don't know all of them but of those whose works i have read um he is uh, he he surpasses um he surpasses everybody in his time um and uh if and i think that after him the next great mutakallim uh, was uh, sheikh uh, the late uh, uh muhammad said ramadan al buti may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on him um so and who took from him he considered him to be uh, his uh, i don't think they his he was his teacher but he uh he was inspired by him and he read his books and he praised his works and he quotes his works so the uh, sheikh mustafa sabri he was an accomplished scholar he was a sheikh al islam he was a sheikh al islam of the ottoman empire um so 
uh, which means the, he, he held the highest scholarly post in the Ottoman Empire. He studied all of the religious sciences, um, but, he, he, but he, he said that the most important science for us to learn in our times is the science of Kalam. Because, the, because people before, um, they, were, they were not, they were just, they lacked religious motivation. They believed, but they weren't motivated to pray. He said, but now, but now their lack of motivation is a reflection of the weakness or even lack of their belief. And this is a phenomenon that we now see as widespread. So this science, uh, this is what it seeks to do. Um, I've, uh, you know, I, I write on this science. I teach courses on this science. I have a course that I teach called Why Islam is True. Um, and um, uh, you can, inshallah, you can, um, I, you can you know, do a search. You can come to my website, go to the YouTube channel and check it out. Um, but the, uh, but this, so this is what this science is about. And, it's, and what it does is it is actually, it's, an, it's part, it's prophetic. It's not philosophy. Kalam is not philosophy. This is, it's actually elaborating the arguments that are there in the Quran, that are there in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And, uh, and what's amazing is that our religion is the only religion that does this. There's no other religion that does this. So when I, so when I teach my students, um, we go through this, uh, I teach a contemporary course called Why Islam is True. We go through this and we go through the arguments. Uh, and, and when they, uh, you know, when they see it, uh, one, one of you know one of the things that you know then, then uh, that they they learn at when they go through the whole thing is they 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 learn that there's no other religion that does this. Every single religion, apart from our religion, is based on faith. Faith. What's faith? Faith is a choice to believe. So if you go to a Christian. And it, or a Christian comes to you, knocks on your door, tells you to to accept the gospel, accept the good news. Then um, there, if you actually if you listen to them, then they will they they'll they'll say bad things about Islam and your religion, and they're trained to do that. Um, and then they will tell you basically what they'll say is that if you become Christian, you'll feel good, you'll feel really good. And, uh, and, uh, and, and God sent his only son to die for your sins and your sins will be forgiven and you will give charity and you will be a good person. And it feels good to be a Christian. Um, why do people become Buddhist? Because it feels good. Okay? They, they, want, they like to meditate. They like to forget about the pain of life and, and they become Buddhist because through Buddhism, you can forget the pains of life through meditation and um, attain nirvana and do all of these things. Is, is there any kind of rational argument that shows that their religion is true? Can anyone teach a course why Buddhism is true? Nobody can. Can anybody teach a course why Christianity is true? Nobody can. Can anybody teach a course why Hinduism is true? Nobody can. They can tell you why it feels good and why, why it feels good and, and, so, and therefore why you should choose to believe it. They'll either say it feels good or they'll say it's part of my culture. So, so, um, so, uh, a, so you know, somebody who comes from a Hindu culture, they'll say, this is my cultural heritage. And so we live in a multicultural society and this is the culture that I come from. This is what my ancestors did. This is what, what my, so uh, Ju Judaism is also like that. It's, an, it's, a, it's become a cultural ancestral faith. And, and in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemns people who simply believe the, the the he condemns the polytheists for simply believing what their ancestors believed. That's not sufficient reason to hold your your faith. You have to you have to ground your faith in uh, in uh, in reason. You need to see that God exists. That prophet that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is genuinely God's messenger. So I'm going to before. So this is. Kalam. I'm going to talk about Russell's teapot and the flying spaghetti monster. But before I do that, <laughs> before I do that, I'm just I, I I I just want to show you. So it's very simple. So it's not Kalam is not is not complicated. It's some of the books of Kalam are complicated, but Kalam is not complicated. So I can prove to you um, the 
the existence so that that was the video that's going to come soon inshallah so i can prove to you the existence of god in uh, one minute so i'll do that i'll say it really quickly um so base so everything in the universe everything in the universe needs a cause there's need it needs something to make it the way that it is so if i look at if i look at the sky it's blue i say why is it blue what made it blue why isn't it some other color if it's day i say why isn't it night and what made it day and if it's night i say why isn't it day and what made it night if the wind blows from east to west i say why is it blowing this way why isn't it blowing the other way if ships sail in the sea i say why do they float why don't they sink why why isn't a ship like lead which i put lead in the water it goes right to the bottom and i, I and i say why is there this variety of animals in the universe why are all of these things the way that they are and so i ask and i search for explanations so i search for explanations about why things in the universe are the way that they are so when i search for an explanation scientist comes along and he says i have an explanation for you and he gives you a scientific explanation so he'll tell you that the sky is blue because the uh, the the particular uh, elements that constitute our atmosphere they scatter the light of the sun certain wavelengths of the light of the sky, of the sun blue in particular they scatter that and it's that's and that's because of their their chemical their molecular properties and since they and they do that and that's why you see the sky as being as as being blue so now you've you've uh, you've got your scientific explanation and you say okay uh okay fine i have the explanation but you don't have the explanation because now you will say why why is it that this atmosphere scatters blue light why doesn't it scatter some other light and then the scientist will give you another explanation that that returns to the molecular composition or uh, the atomic structure and uh, the the wavelengths of light and so and and then and then that will raise another question and that will raise another question why because science there's something there's science there's something there's a particular thing about science that we need to understand and that thing is that science explains the things in the universe with reference to other things in the universe and so and as long as you do that you never ask you never answer the question you never answer the question why are things the way that they are because when there's one thing that needs something else to make it the way that it is and then you point to something else that needs something to make it the way that it is you haven't answered the question you've just delayed the answer because that then raises another question in fact it compounds the problem because first you had one thing which you wanted to explain why it is the way that it is now you have two and then you say three now you have three now you have four now you have five you haven't you haven't you haven't given a true explanation the true explanation is that everything in the universe depends on some one some thing that does not depend on anything else that does not need anything to make it the way that it is and this is god and uh, and uh, and it's in the quran allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says allahu samad a samad means the one on who who doesn't need anyone and everything needs him and this is this is you know, there's a technical term for this it's called the necessary being and there's other there's other aspects to this argument that we can elaborate i said 1 minute i went slightly over 1 minute but this is rational evidence this is how we know that the universe depends on god and then you can you can prove that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is god's messenger by looking at the miracles that he brought to as evidence for his genuine messengerhood and the greatest miracle is the quran and the, there's the scientific miracle of the quran that many many of us are familiar with there's also the linguistic miracle of the quran which you can know first hand you can know second hand you can experience it so i you know i teach a course where we where we learn how to experience the this the the, the this in the quran there's a science called the science of balagha that that teaches you how to experience the miraculous nature of the quran um and there's other there's other arguments there's uh, of his character of his life story and you have and and 
you can you can demonstrate that the Prophet وسلم, could not have been an imposter. And so when you do that, you see that there's no God, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, and it's grounded in argument, and you have an evidence-based knowledge. And that's what Iman is. What is Iman? All, all of our scholars, you know, so if you study the tafsir of Baydawi, which is studied in, in all of the classical curricula in the Indian subcontinent at Azhar everywhere, um, he'll define Iman. And, and, and how will he define Iman? He'll define it as something called Tasdiq. And how is Tasdiq defined? If you read in the Hawashi and, and other around. So what, what, what is Iman? Iman and Tasdiq, what they are, they are an inward acceptance of evidence-based knowledge. That's what Iman is. Iman is not faith. It's not believe in it because you feel good. Iman is inward acceptance of evidence-based knowledge. It's based on knowledge. Our belief is based on knowledge. Our religion is based on knowledge. It's based on evidence. And it's the only religion that's like that. It's the only religion that's based on evidence. It's the only religion that's based on evidence-based knowledge. So the um, uh, so the uh, so so this is and, and so this is like a brief explanation, and it's elaborated in the science of kalam. And the old books of kalam they elaborate it in light of previous uh, old uh, philosophical objections and arguments, some of which are still relevant today. But if you learn it, you can apply it to modern modern questions, modern uh, modern uh, answer, modern objections. And um, and that's uh, that's a contemporary practical application of this science of kalam, and um, and that's what I uh, you know that's what I like to do, um, and uh, and so uh, so I wanted to illustrate illustrate this um, the importance of kalam um, with a video. So before uh, before before uh, you know our uh, moderator um, shows shows the video. Just uh, you know, you have an adult audience. There's there's some sections of the video where you'll have to lower your gaze. There'll be there'll be a picture of a man who's uh, who's naked, and we learn uh, in the uh, that the prophet the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who we have evidence is God's messenger. He commanded us to lower our gaze from the. Uh, uh, lower our gaze when when there appears an image where the person isn't properly clothed. So um, and so there'll be there'll be an image like that. It'll just show for a short while. So you have lower your gaze, and there'll be another there'll be another image also of some people who uh, uh, you know uh, you know a woman uh, who so there's so women they also have to be clothed in a particular way. Um, and if they're not clothed in that particular way, then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who who we have evidence is the messenger of God, um, told us told us that God has commanded us to lower our gaze. And so 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 this is so I I'm uh, I'm telling you this, uh, and so inshallah we'll lower our gaze. But I want you also also just to note that the 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 the, the change that comes in in our uh, in in learning the Sharia, right? So so if you see that the Prophet Sallallahu is genuinely God's messenger, then it's not just this is halal, this is haram, this is like this. No, it's the messenger of God, who we have evidence is the messenger of God, told us that God has commanded us to do this. The nature of 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 the of of what we are supposed to do and, and not supposed to it changes. It's not. It's not. Uh, it's not a. It's not a feel-good thing, um, and it's just. It's the command of God, and you have evidence that this is the command of God. So, um, so that was. Uh, so, with that digression and with that kind of uh, um, uh, reminder uh, to um, for us, Lord the let's watch this. I can't hear anything. I don't know if anybody else can.
are one creator which flies in a spaghetti and a monster. It's a prayer and religion like few in the world. I believe thou art the creator of goodness and nourishment and of sustenance. But for 15-year-old Pastafarian Lachlan, it's a movement he believes in and one he hopes more people will take seriously. I thank the pasta and the sauce and the meatballs, for they provide me with all my needs. Ramen. We've got things like the, uh, I'd rather you didn't. So um, these are kind of like commandments, are they? Sort of similar, yeah. Yep. But uh, the Flying Spaghetti Monster is not too strict, so it's only I'd rather you didn't. There's no question that Pastafarianism is an unusual religion. I'd really rather you didn't build a multi-million dollar church um, slash temple, mosque, shrine to my noodly goodness. When the money could be better spent, take your pick. Ending poverty, curing diseases, living in peace, loving with passion, and lowering the cost of cable. Okay. <laughs> But for Pakuranga Year 11 student Lachlan, the religion, although relaxed, is no laughing matter. I believe in the flying spaghetti monster. I believe in all the virtues and uh, things you should follow in Pastafarianism. Uh, it's fairly similar to most other religions. So what do you say to people who simply say, this religion is ridiculous? Um, well, I think it's about as ridiculous as most religions. Most re religions are don't follow logical sense, but uh, that's why well, they're a belief. They're not a knowledge. Of course, it is a bit, uh, it's not quite as strict. It's got a bit of an element of humor, you know, because what's life without a bit of humor? It's a bit boring. But there was little humor to be found when Lachlan approached his school principal, asking for permission to wear a colander, a key article of faith for all Pastafarians, in his school photo. He asked to see the colander. So I pulled it out, my bag, and I showed it to him, and he just went, no. He thought you were taking the piss? Yeah. Were you? No, this is uh, my religion. Um, I've been a pastifying for two years. Why do you think you should be able to wear that colander in your school photo? I think it's fairly simple. Other religions are allowed to wear their headgear. I'm not sure why I shouldn't be allowed to. And in this respect, Lachlan appears to have the law on his side. The Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster was officially recognised by the government when it was approved to conduct marriages in 2015. But in keeping with his religion's relaxed approach to life in general, Lachlan has decided to accept his school's ruling for now and concentrate on other parts of the church's teachings. Do you actually like pasta? Oh, I love pasta. Pasta's great. I love uh, ravioli, spaghetti, we have actually a holiday dedicated to it, um, Ramadan, which is where you will eat only two-minute noodles. And I thought, why not? Why don't you just go a bit further? And I went four days just eating two-minute noodles. It wasn't too hard. A bit of you know showing my love to the uh, his holy noodliness. Okay, so um, <laughs> um, I, I showed that video to my kids and we talked about it. Um, and uh, Alhamdulillah, they had the, they had the right uh, responses. Um, so it's, uh, I found it, um, uh, it's, this is a parody. This is a parody. It's, he actually, he's actually, it's, it's, uh, it's written in, it's said, actually based on something that's written. Uh, but it's, it's, this was said with humor but it's actually a logical argument. And this, the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster, it has a history. It has a history in um, the arguments between religion and science in America. So in 1999, uh, the Kansas uh, uh, School Board of Education, it approved a science curriculum. And in that science curriculum, there was no mention of the age of the earth. There was no mention of the Big Bang Theory. There was no mention of macro evolution, of one kind of animal turning into another kind of animal, evolving into another kind of animal. What's the motivation behind that? The motivation behind that is that a literal reading of the Bible, of the book of Genesis, it leads 
Christians to the conclusion that the earth or the universe is 5,000 years old. And the fact that it's five different readings, 5,000, 7,000, 10,000, but in that range, um, and that flies in the face of scientific conclusions. We believe that the earth is millions of years old and the universe is billions of years old. And 5,000 is very far from being accurate. Um, so, uh, so there's a conflict between the reasoned conclusions of, uh, of, uh, of science and between the faith, the faith of the Christians, the unreasoned faith of the Christians. What's faith to them? Faith to them is a choice to believe because I feel good. So I feel good and it makes me feel good. So I'm going to believe in it. So the, uh, but then it makes me feel good to believe in something that goes against science. Now what do I do? And that's the conflict. So, so the, the reason why they didn't mention the age of the earth is because young, they're called young earth creationists. They, uh, they, they say that the literal reading of the Bible, um, gives an age for the earth that's 5,000, 6,000 years old, a literal. Uh, and so that also goes against the Big Bang theory, because according to the Big Bang, the universe is 14 billion years old. And, uh, and, and, and so, so that's why the Big Bang theory is omitted. And it goes against a literal reading of the book of Genesis. It, it uh, leads one to the conclusion that animals, all of them, all animals, not just human beings, all animals were created as they are in their present form right at the beginning. None of them evolved from any other animal. And so macro evolution, the, 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 the one kind of animal becoming another kind of animal versus micro evolution, which is small changes in one kind of animal, like a black moth and a white moth. And you know, these, there's a famous peppered moth example. Uh, so the, uh, so macro evolution, they omitted it. They said, we're not going to talk about it. And it was approved by the state board of education. And, uh, so Christians, they they say that uh, they say that either they don't want these things taught, or they say give us equality, give us equality, teach evolution, teach Big Bang, and let us teach, to let us teach the fact that that the biblical creation narrative alongside it, and so students can make up their own mind. And on the other side, you have scientists. They say this is absurd. This is absurd because the conclusions of your faith are clearly wrong. The conclusions of your faith are clearly wrong. And so, so they say, no, but we have the freedom of religion. We have the freedom of religion, freedom of religion. We can believe whatever we want. We have the right to believe whatever we want. So they made up, the atheists, they made up the flying spaghetti monster. And they said, okay, you have the rights to believe whatever we want. We will make up a religion. Okay, and and this is called the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. And there's all of these ridiculous things. And uh, there are all these ridiculous things they believe in. And we want equal rights with you. So so we don't so now what we want is we, we don't we don't want you not, in school not just to teach Christian creationism and uh, and uh, and alongside uh, evolution and all these other things. We want you we want to we want you to teach also spaghetti flying spaghetti monsterism alongside it and it's i have a right i can wear headgear other people wear headgear and he makes fun of ramadan in there and we'll talk about ramadan and ramadan in a second but uh but the uh, the uh, um you know but just as it as it got so when he makes fun of ramadan i don't think he's being irreverent i don't believe he's being irreverent and i'll tell you why in a second so uh uh, so the uh, so he's uh, so they said okay we should have we should have a right to do this and I was just looking around on on reading reading about it and apparently the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster is recognized as an, <laughs> as an official religion in New Zealand so um so so they so what they're doing is they're trying to make a point they're trying to make a point and that's why when you in that video when that guy was asked. When that guy, don't you, what do you say if your religion is, if somebody says your religion is ridiculous? They say, well, it's, well all religions are. <laughs> it's just as ridiculous as all religions. Why? Because all religions are simply 
choices to believe because it makes you feel good. And here's something that makes me feel good. Okay, he doesn't even have the Ten Commandments. He has the eight, I prefer you don't. And so that makes me feel really good. And he says, don't build mosques, but lower the cost of cable. That makes me feel really good. So, so here you go. I have, I've made up another religion that makes me feel good. And you, make, you have had another religion that makes you feel good. And I'll say, I'll say wild and crazy things, just as you'll say wild and crazy things. So when you laugh at me, you're actually laughing at yourself. <laughs> hey, and so, so this, is, this is an argument. And new atheists, they'll quote, the, they'll, they'll mention this. They'll mention the flying spaghetti monster. And this is what they're referring to. And with respect to Christianity, it's a really good argument. Right. So if you so I've spent the last year or two um, studying, uh, you know, reading a lot of what uh, reading a lot of the new what the new atheists have written. Um, and um, inshallah, I'll be uh, so I, I uh, we I we go through I go through this with my students as well. We study uh, their works. And so the uh, one of the things that I found is that many of their arguments are really good. They have good arguments. They have good arguments. And their arguments are good against Christianity. And uh, and they're sound. So this here, this is a sound argument. Because this is what Christianity is based on. This is what uh, Buddhism is based on. This is what Hinduism is based on. And you can do anything. Okay? And so there you go. And so it's a really good argument. But this is not what Islam is based on. And that's where that's how we started this 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 lecture. That's how we started this lecture in that the uh, in that the uh, the, uh, the that that our religion is based on evidence and it's the only religion that's based on evidence. So um, so so when he so when he's making fun of Ramadan and he says that there's Ramadan Ramadan, where they only eat a certain kind of noodle and a number of noodles, that's like they're fasting. Um, I don't. So, so you could a Muslim could have a number of responses to it. So one Muslim could say that you know uh, one. I think that unfortunately the way that many Muslims would respond to this, they would say this is hate speech. They're making fun of my religion, and this is Islamophobia, and we have to go to the Human Rights Commission, and and. And and start a petition, and stop the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster because they're Islamophobic. Okay, so that's crazy. Okay, that's crazy. Don't do that. Okay, if you're thinking of doing that, don't do that. And if you know somebody who's going to do it, tell him don't do that. You don't need to do that, and you don't need to do that because the because what they're doing is they're making an argument. They're making an argument, and. And I don't believe that he's being irreverent to Islam because I don't believe that they know what Islam is. I don't believe that they know that Islam is an evidence-based religion, that, that belief in Islam is inward acceptance of an evidence-based conclusion. They don't know that. And when somebody doesn't know that and they make a joke about something, we don't say that they're being irreverent. We have sympathy for them. And we say they don't know, and we go and we teach them, and we talk to them. We talk to them, and 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 Muslims should be approachable people, just like the the the, the people who I started off this conversation telling you about. That we should we should be able to people should come to us, ask we, we uh, they ask questions, we answer their questions, we revise our positions. We don't have anything to hide, right? And so. Uh, so what you do is so this is so this high, and how do you learn this? You learn this by studying the science of kalam, and and you don't you don't have to have all the answers, right? So as long as you know somebody who can help you, it's fine. Right? You you can you can go you you can just you can just talk to somebody and say well that makes a lot of sense. I don't know what the answer is. I'll find out. I'll come back to you. We don't need to feel insecure, and uh, and we do have all the answers. And uh, and I can and alhamdulillah I'm able to say that because I asked so many questions, and I got answers. And once I got I, once I saw answer after answer after answer after answer. Then there came a t there came a time when I said that when I have a question, if I don't know the answer, I know there is an answer. 
even if I might not know it. Right. So, um, and uh, and that's uh, and that's that's what leads to the love of Islam. So, um, so this is so this is uh, this is the flying spaghetti monster, and uh, and 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 so the the argument that he is making here, we need to engage with the argument. And how do we engage with the argument? We engage with the argument first of all by saying that Islam is based on evidence. We present the evidence. Uh, and we don't go the political route like the Christians go, right? So the uh, uh, the uh, so the the other the other aspect, the other aspect of it is, um, I want to show you very briefly. Uh, so he talked about the, the theory of evolution, and so uh, evolution is uh, is is at the center of science religion debates with between atheists and Christians. But it's, it shouldn't be at the center of debates with Muslims. So let's, and I'm, I'm going to, and I, I'll explain to you why. So when you, very briefly, I'll give you an overview. So when you, when you uh, so we're an evidence-based religion. So what does that mean? It means that I have evidence that God exists. I explained to that to you very briefly. I have evidence that the Prophet wasallam is really God's messenger. When I have evidence that the Prophet wasallam is really God's messenger, then what happens is that revelation becomes a source of knowledge. If I can demonstrate that the Prophet wasallam is really God's messenger, then when I open up the Quran, I know that this is God speaking, that God is speaking in the Quran. God is speaking in the Quran. So, and 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 the God, the one who created the universe, he's telling me something, and this is a source of knowledge. It becomes a source of knowledge. So, scientific observation is a source of knowledge, and the Quran is a source of knowledge, and mental reflection is a source of knowledge. So, when I analyze a problem, I need to have all of the sources of knowledge before me. When I place all of those sources of knowledge before me, what do I see? I see with respect to evolution, first of all, that evolution does not disprove the existence of God. Uh, because what is evolution? Evolution is a scientific explanation. What is science? Science is the explanation of things in the universe with reference to other, by reference to other things in the universe. That's what science is. And science is an incomplete explanation. So the, the process of evolution, the process of evolution, it would, if, there's if, you know, if, there, if there were to be scientific evidence that demonstrates that it's true, then this, the, the Mustafa Sabri, he said, so I'm not the one who's saying that Mustafa Sabri, the Sheikh of Islam of the, of the, of the Ottoman Empire, a hundred years ago, he wrote, uh, he wrote uh, less than a hundred years ago, but uh, he wrote in his book, uh, famous book of Al-Aqal, he said that if evolution were to be true, it would be even greater evidence for the existence of God than if it were not to be true. Because, uh, because when you have a, when you have a, so a car is evidence of somebody who made the car. But if you have a factory, it's even greater evidence because it's more intricate, it's, it's more needy. It has more need of a creator, someone to make it. And so evolution would be like the factory, and the particular animals would be like the would be like the like the car, and everything is contingent, meaning everything is in the universe. It needs something else to make it the way that it is, and it points to the existence of God. So right from the outset, evolution does not is not an argument for atheism. It has nothing to do with atheism. So so and and this is this comes from our argument for the existence of God, which is the argument from contingency. We call it. It has a particular Muslim flavor. Um, so the and we learned this in the science of kalam. And so so this is this is evolution. So the second thing is that when I look at what what is what does the theory of evolution say? It says that animals evolved from other uh, from other from other creatures. So let's, so for, first of all, in the Quran and Sunnah, there's nothing that says that, uh, that animals apart from human beings were created the way that they are. So as Muslims, we are not bound. There's nothing, God hasn't told us 
that other animals didn't evolve. So if I have scientific evidence that tells me that the uh, that animals they evolved from sim they were simple and they became more complex over time, then you can hold that position. But human beings, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He created them directly. There's verses in the Quran that indicate that. So um, uh, I know there's people who say that uh, that uh, that these verses they mean something else. That's a separate. I'm not. That's not. I don't want to go there. Okay, I, I want us to understand at a high level the, uh, the reasoning process. So let's assume that there's verses in the Quran that say that, uh, that, uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he created human beings directly. So if I assume that, that there are verses in the Quran that say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created human beings directly, then this is a source of knowledge. So I have the scientific uh, information and I have this information and I put them together. And... I believe miracles are possible because the universe depends on God. So I believe that fire burns, but fire actually doesn't burn, but Allah creates the fire, he creates the burning, but fire is associated with burning. Wherever there's fire, there's burning. I believe that. If I believe, if I go back in the past, that wherever there was fire, there's going to be burning. But I believe that the Prophet Ibrahim, السلام, when he was thrown into the fire, it didn't burn him. It was a miracle. So, and miracles are possible and miracles, they happen and, uh, and, and God tells us that they happened in the past and revelation is a source of knowledge. So if evolution were to be true and it were to be true of all, all other, all, of all other, of all animals and revelation is a source of knowledge, evidence-based source of knowledge, then human beings would be a miraculous exception. And we do that for, for, uh, for, for fire and burning and other miracles. And so why for human beings, there is no problem. Problem, problem solved. But it's an evidence-based conclusion. It's an evidence-based solution, and 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 so so we don't. And so when somebody invents the church of the spaghetti, uh, flying spaghetti monster, I laugh at it just like the atheists laugh at it. But it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't apply to me. It applies to Christianity. It doesn't apply to me. And how do I know it doesn't apply to me? It, I, 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 it, the, the, the way that I know it doesn't apply to me is by learning the arguments and the methods of, of reasoning that are presented by the scholars of Kalam. Now, I promised I'd talk about Russell's teapots, but um, Russell's teapot is, it's actually very similar to the flying spaghetti monster. Um, and, uh, and basically what he says is Bertrand Russell, he was a famous atheist at the beginning of the, uh, of the 1900s. And he, uh, he said that, so the, the debate between Christians and atheists, it went like this. The, the, the atheist said, give me evidence that, uh, that uh, proved uh, that God doesn't exist. There's no evidence that God exists. And the Christian, he says that, well, prove to me God doesn't exist. There's no evidence that he doesn't exist. So you can't prove to me he doesn't exist. I can believe what I want. And this argument persists to our times. And you find Muslims making this argument. Okay, and 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 so, but this is that's not it's not it's not Muslims shouldn't make that argument. When an atheist says, "Prove to me God exists," we prove to him God exists. We don't say, "You prove to me he doesn't exist." But now, but and so that's what that's what somebody with a training in kalam would do. But uh, but when you when you look at uh, when you look at what, the, the Christian, so how did that go? So the, the way because they 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 base their belief on faith. Because they base their belief on faith. When the uh, when uh, when the atheist says, "Prove to me God exists," they say, "Well, you prove to me He doesn't He doesn't exist. You can't prove to me He, he doesn't exist. I can believe what I want." And so Bertrand Russell he has a response to that. He said, "Okay," he said, "Okay, um, there are let let me say that let's suppose that there's a teapot, a small teapot, and it's orbiting in space between Mars and Earth." And it's too small for a telescope to pick up. And so there's no evidence that it's not there. So I believe in it. So I believe in flying teapots that orbit or, or orbit the uh, orbit the uh, the earth between uh, or orbit the sun between earth and Mars. And and there's no evidence, but you can't prove to me that they're not there. And uh, and so so uh, but everybody will say that's absurd. And so he says the same thing with you. The same thing with you. And now, what do they say? They've evolved this. They say it's like believing in fairies and elves. 
fairies and elves. You have no evidence that they uh, that they uh, uh, that they uh, uh, don't exist. So you can so you can believe in them, and 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 belief in God is like believing in fairy, fairies and elves. But that this kind of argument only applies if you say if you admit that there's no evidence for the existence of God, but there is. So uh, this is a uh, this is uh, um, this is uh, uh, so I, I was going to talk to you about kalam Brussels teapots and the flying spaghetti monster, and the general idea is the study of kalam, and uh, and I uh, I visited uh, Darul Qasim. It's been a while. I visited Darul Qasim. Um, uh, Sheikh Amin uh, showed me around. Um, uh, and I, uh, you know, I uh, he I surveyed the curriculum, and I, uh, I, uh, you know, there's something I wrote up on it, which hasn't hasn't been published yet. Maybe in the, inshallah, one day it'll it'll see the light of publication. Um, but um, but I understand that there's uh, that uh, you guys um, um, study kalam there as well, and uh, so inshallah for those of you who um, who are interested in studying the science. I hope that this will be a motivation for you to study the science and um, and it will give you an idea of why it's important and how it could be applied. Um, I'm glad you were able to, to mention Russell's teapots there at the end because I, I myself was curious about how that worked. Um, so we want to open the floor for any uh, Q and A for anybody that wants to put a question into the YouTube chat. Um, we have one here. Um, let's see. So it's the is the ultimate criteria for truth our reason or our intuition? Why? So. Um, uh, okay, so is the ultimate criteria for our truth, our reason, or our intuition? So we start off by uh, defining our terms. And so we learn this in logic. So another science that we study, Islamic logic, we learn uh, how to define things and the importance of defining things. You can't reason clearly until you define things. So this question, it, it started off by asking about truth. So what does it mean for something to be true? Um, so we need to understand that before we answer the question. So there are, um, there are, this is, this is a, so I'm going to give you the standard definition of truth according to um, our scholars. And this is the Quranic, this is what it means in the Quran as well. So truth, when something is true, it means that it corresponds to reality. So if I, uh, so, um, uh, so uh, God exists is true because the statement God exists corresponds to reality. In reality, God really does exist. Um, but uh, for example, uh, there's teapots orbiting uh, the uh, in space in between Mars and Jupiter. I believe to be false. Okay, so so this is something. This is something that's false because it doesn't correspond to reality. Things aren't really that way. So the question now it becomes that if I want to discover whether something corresponds to reality, should I reason or should I just go by my intuition? So um, a Christian will come and he'll say that by my intuition, I know that God, that Jesus is God. A Hindu will come and he'll say that by my intuition, I know that there's all of these gods and that there's this God with, and I go to him and I get good luck and it helps me in my, uh, in my business. And so I hang him in my, in my business. And uh, some other person will say, by my intuition, I know this. Somebody else will say, by my intuition, I know this. So intuition is not, is not something that is, uh, that is publicly verifiable. It's something that's within a person. And, so, and everybody claims to, to have their to hold their beliefs based on intuition so uh, so reason allah subhanahu wa ta'ala why did he give us a mind he gave us a mind so that we can know him 
He gave us a mind so that we could know him. We could know that he exists. We know that the prophet is genuine. This is the purpose of our mind. The purpose of our mind isn't to do science. It isn't to make rockets and, let, and to land on the moon or to make even worse, make nuclear bombs and kill people. That's not why Allah gave us the mind. That's become the purpose of the mind now. Why did Allah give us a mind? It's so that we could discover our responsibility. That's why if somebody doesn't have a mind, doesn't have, doesn't have a mind, they're no longer morally responsible. They're, they're, nothing is haram. They go to paradise if they were born that way. So the, the, the purpose of the mind is for us to use, to use it to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the only publicly verifiable criterion that we have to, to ascertain whether a statement is true, it corresponds to reality or it doesn't, shared, publicly verifiable, it means that I want something that I accept and my, uh, my opponent accepts. And then we talk about it based on that. If it's just intuition, I have an intuition, he'll say he has an intuition and you won't get anywhere. And so the prophets, when they came, they didn't come to people and say, follow your intuition. Because then the, then the, the mushrikun would say, fine, well, I, my, my intuition is that I should worship 360 idols. The Prophet ﷺ came and said, this is false. It's not true. And he said that, that according to reason, if you use your mind, Sayyidina, Sayyidina Ibrahim said, Ata'buduna. Uh, do you do you worship something that you carve with your own hands when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created you and what you and the and the idols that you make? Um uh, in other words, you're contingent and the idols are contingent, they need something to make make them the way that they are, and that and they depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who doesn't need anything, rational argument. Um so what is he doing? He is using, he's, he's not saying use your intuition, he's using reason. So how do we know that, that we were supposed to use reason and not intuition? There's two reasons. The first way in which we know is that, that the only way to prove something true to somebody else is through a series of shared, uh, uh, shared experience. And that is, that's our reason, not, not intuition is private. And the second thing is that that's what the Quran tells us. That's what the prophets and messengers did. That's what our religion, that's why when somebody doesn't have religion, who doesn't have reason, they're, long, they're, long, they're no longer morally responsible. So, um, so it's uh, reason and that's why. Thank you, Shif Hamza. Um, there's a question here about first principles. So, um, you know, they're asking, how do you deal or how does someone deal with another person or a philosophy that denies first principles? Um, and can you recommend um, uh, a text that highlights first principles in Islamic theology? Um, so um, first principles, this is a, uh, it's a uh, modern term. Uh, the, in, uh, in our books, this is called Ilm Daruri. So at the beginning of uh, books on Kalam, they'll divide knowledge into Daruri and Nadari. Um, nadari is, Nadari, the translation of Nadari, it means inferential, based on inference. The translation of Daruri, Daruri is sometimes translated as necessary, immediate. This is an incorrect translation. Okay, so Daruri doesn't mean necessary, doesn't mean immediate. Daruri means non-inferential. It's knowledge that you arrive at without inference. So I have knowledge, knowledge that I, things that I know, that I know without having to infer anything, without having to reason. And there's other things that I know that require reason. And when I, so for example, I know that um, the, conting the contingency of the universe, I know without inference. So when I look at the things around me and I see that they need something to make them the way that they are, this is ilm daruri. It's something that I, that's non-inferential knowledge. It's something that I know to be true. How do I know it? I look inside myself. Philosophers, they call this introspection. I, I examine myself, I find that I know it. And so there's knowledge that I look inside myself. I find that I know it. I find that I know it. So this is non-inferential knowledge, what the questioner has, uh, has described as first principles. 
So this non-inferential knowledge, inferential knowledge is based on it. So all knowledge, it starts with non-inferential knowledge. And then you take non-inferential knowledge, you take two, two pieces of knowledge, you arrange them in a particular way, organize them, you study in logic, and then you think about it, and then you learn something new. And then you take that and you put it with something else, and you think about it and you learn something new. And that's the process. So there's so so all so all knowledge that we have, all inferential knowledge, it goes back through an inference process to basic uh, basic knowledge, um, basic non-inferential knowledge, which here has been called as has as first principles. So um, so the the uh, so somebody if somebody denies first principles, then they so this is this is termed skepticism philosophical skepticism this is and there's many there's many varieties of it and uh the the most uh the the most complex is called peronian skepticism it means basically you can't know anything so what this means is you, you the 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 implication of denying uh, first principles is knowledge is impossible knowledge so if you if you if you don't know first principles you can't know anything so somebody comes and says i don't know anything i don't believe anything I don't, I don't, I, I doubt. So it's like the Chinese philosopher who, who dreamed he was a butterfly and then he woke up and then he said, I can't know anything for certain because I don't know if I am now, if I am a butterfly dreaming that I'm a human being or I'm a human being <laughs> who dreamed he was a butterfly. So this, this, uh, this butterfly thing, you could turn it into something like the flying spaghetti monster and, uh, and make a, make a whole story out of it. Um, so, uh, so the, the, the denying first principles, philosophical skepticism, it's, it's, uh, it's not, it's not a, it's, it's not a real problem because people who deny it, they deny, deny something that they know. And when somebody denies this, you can't reason with them because there's, you don't, you no longer have a shared common set of starting points. So reason is, let's start with things that we both know, we both admit, and let's see where that leads us to. And, and then I can show you why, uh, why uh, you should believe what I believe. But if somebody doesn't give you anything, and, and, and in this case, they, they, they can't know anything. They can't know anything. They can't know that they know anything. They can't know that they don't know anything. It's just knowledge is completely impossible. This is the most extreme form of skepticism. There are milder forms as well. Um, so this is, is, it's not really, it's not really, it's not really an argument, right? So, uh, so, and, and this person, he will, he will, uh, he'll say this to you in the context of a religious discussion, but when it comes to everything else in life, he's not going to behave in this way. He's going to, he's not going to be, nobody lives life in this way. If you live life in this way, you would never get out of bed. You just stare into space and die like a vegetable. So, uh, but but everybody, in order for you to go and do things, um, so it's not a real uh, philosophical position, but it is denying. It's a denial of philosophy. And the way to the, the normally the way to to argue with such people is to use something that's called a dialectic argument. You take things that they admit. So you and, and and things that they claim to know and when there are things that they claim to know then this uh, this then um uh this then is inconsistent with their denial of first principles there's a name for this kind of argument but that's basically the way you do it so it doesn't there aren't you don't really need um you don't really need it's not that complicated so it's discussed in the beginning of books like shahar al-qaid or other other books of kalam they call the sufi sta'iya and uh, that's basically how the argument it works. Right. The questioner actually um, asked, "Are these just sophists?" So the sophistaia that's mentioned in Shadow yeah, Father, yeah, probably the same same type of argument as those who deny all types of knowledge today. Um, and of course, this is something Imam Ghazali famously dealt with himself and talked about how Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala uh, removed him from that uh, shubhat. So Imam al-Ghazali's thing, that's important because that is with respect to himself. Yes. So there's, right? So there's, so there's, there's somebody who comes and he says, I don't, he denies first principles. This is with respect to somebody else. With respect to yourself, that's now, that's where Imam al-Ghazali comes, right? So with respect to yourself, that's like an extreme kind of, uh, 
self doubt, uh, and right. that is uh, that's a different problem. Yeah, it's a good point. This is referring to, to other people who bring it to to Muslims, right? Um, there's a question here on quantum physics. Um, so you mentioned that quantum physics uh, affirms that some substances can come from nothing. How do we respond to that kind of argument? Um, we say that we deny that it came from nothing. So uh, the reason why, so a quantum physicist will say that something comes from nothing is because he is because he he has an assumption. He has an assumption, and that's the assumption of materialism. And he says that in order for anything to come, I must be able to point at something else in the universe and say that that thing in the universe caused this. So when a physicist says that uh, there, this thing has no cause, then what is he really saying? He's saying that I can't find anything else in the universe that is bringing this about. So that's what he's doing. And so we'll say, fine. Okay. So if nothing in the universe did it, then what did it? So if nothing in the universe did it, you don't throw away the, throw away the principle of causation. You say something other than the thing in the universe did it. So this is actually uh, the fact when they, when they see spontaneous quantum phenomena, if it were to be true that there is no physical association with it, then this would be a absolutely clear evidence for the existence of God. You would say that this is there is a something that is immaterial that is bringing it about. So it's not so when I can't find any physical thing that's a cause for a phenomenon, I don't throw away the, the idea that that every effect needs a cause. That's a non-inferential concept. But rather, I throw away the idea that everything needs a physical cause. And I expand my horizons and I open my mind to the idea that something exists beyond the physical universe. Wonderful. Um, uh, next, inshallah, we'll, we'll keep this last unless uh, th there are some other questions, but they're more about references to certain authors or texts um, that um, I think we can we can bypass. Um, or I, I can mention to Sheikh Hamza later and then ha have them email to Darul Qasim. But this question is um, on critics of kalam and philosophy. So it says, we often hear critics of kalam claim our tradition has not, quote, caught up to modern philosophy and that our theologians are supposedly unequipped to respond. What would you, how would you respond to that? Um, so uh, the first part of it is uh, our tradition has not caught up to modern philosophy. That is, uh, um, so I'll, uh, so the question is, the, qu the question, so let me start with the end of it, end part of it, that our theologians are unequipped to respond. That's false. So uh, they're perfectly equipped to respond. Um, but, uh, and uh, so I've, uh, I've uh, tried it out. So I've, I, I, I tested this because I worked for three years um, with uh, philosophers, with scientists, on the intersection of kalam and philosophy and modern science. And um, I kind of carefully, like I tested things and I asked people questions and I learned their arguments. And I, uh, based on firsthand experience, I, I saw that they are, they really, they don't have any argument. So, uh, so in, my, um, in my estimation, uh, modern science and philosophy it is, uh, uh, it is, uh, it gains, the reason why people hold it up in high regard is because um, it's associated with the material progress of the West. So, uh, so anything that comes from Harvard University or Stanford University, because it's associated with material progress, people associate the, uh, they, uh, in a non-philosophical way, they associate the sophistication of uh, Western philosophy um, and the correctness of that with the material success. Um, and so this, this is taqlid, it's not, it's unreasoned. It's an unreasoned conclusion. 
But if you actually look at the substantial issues where uh, modern science and philosophy, they intersect with our belief, um, everywhere where they're at odds with our belief, they're wrong. And you can actually show that. So, I mean, so this is it's a general question. So, uh, so I'm, I'm giving a general answer. Uh, but if you take specifics, any specific thing, we can work through it. The, the, the challenge is actually, uh, the challenge is just understanding the, the Western terms. So the, uh, the, since science is now in the language of math and uh, uh, you need to, uh, you know, you need to, uh, there's all of these terms you need to understand. So to somebody who hasn't, who hasn't uh, learned science, who hasn't learned mathematics, um, it'll be difficult for them to respond. So I, I actually, I believe that a part of studying the Islamic sciences now, particularly Islamic theology, is you have to study science and you have to study math more than philosophy. Science and math is more important than philosophy. Western philosophy isn't really important. Western philosophy uh, is, it's just, it's ends, like the, the, end, the end point of Western philosophy is skepticism. It's a denial of knowledge, and uh, and I've if you talk to basically any philosopher who goes through philosoph who goes through uh, has a graduate degree in philosophy, PhD in philosophy, they don't believe anything. They just what they what they what they believe is that that you can't prove anything. They learn how to they learn how to how to make counter arguments to any position that you could hold, and so they end up being philosophical skeptics, and they're not really so so modern philosophy isn't really. It's just it just appears to be complicated, but uh, uh, but you know uh, uh, it's not it's not a, it's not the threat. The threat is science and math. So what what is so we need our theologians. We need them to study science. We need them to study math in a way that integrates with their study of kalam. Um, and uh, that is um, so that's that's what's um, that's what's needed. And um, it's actually something that I am uh, would love to do. Yeah, very good. Um, I think that more or less, I, I think what the questioner was um, suggesting, and this is really coming from someone else, was that is there a field in modern philosophy which poses a, a challenge that uh, the mutakalimun need to respond to? Um, but I, I think you've, you've just answered that mm -hmm. with, with skepticism. Okay, so uh, Jazakallah khair, Ustaz, uh, for your time. This was wonderful. Uh, we hope uh, those of you who are watching benefited. And to visit um, Basira Education, okay, they have so many wonderful programs up. Um, Sheikh Hamza is responding weekly to questions on, on atheism, on family issues, um, like the LGBTQ question, um, and questions on scientism, on, on materialism. And mashallah, just really puts things into great clarity and perspective for us. Thank you for hosting me. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh Hamza and Dr. Muhammad for helping us for for this beautiful program. There's a lot of other questions that we weren't able to get to because of time. Um, so, inshallah, if you have uh, these questions, you could email uh, Dar Qasim or uh, at um, events at darqasim.org, inshallah, and then we could um, forward the questions to Sheikh Hamza. Um, and then um, this will be the last program of our adult education um, series uh, for, for this semester. So, inshallah, for those who want to uh, hear the previous ones, you can go to darqasim.org and click on the events tab. Um, and there you will see all the other courses that we had. Um, Data Academy um, and and many others, uh, one on Surah Yusuf. So there's multiple uh, opportunities there as well. So inshallah, Jazakallah Khair Sheikh Hamza for taking out his time. I know we uh, we went a little over time, but Alhamdulillah, I think everyone benefited. And uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.